Oh. Hello everybody. So, uh, uh, I would like to remind you that in the last class we had discussed the phase transitions of pure substances from one physical state to another. Now, just one thing I would like to mention regarding that, that whatever transitions we had discussed in the last class, the all of these they are referred to as the first order transitions or the transitions of the first kind, because in those particular transitions we found that the first derivative of thermodynamic potential, for instance in this case it is G, the first derivative is S minus del G del T at constant P and the volume which is del G del P at constant T. So, these two parameters they had undergone an abrupt discontinuity at the transition. As a result, these transitions they are known as the first order transitions or transitions of the first or they are known as the transitions of the first kind. Here I would just like to mention that the in the second order transitions what happens is that the, the uh, first derivatives of the thermodynamic potentials namely in this case it is entropy and volume. The, the first derivatives of the thermodynamic potential gives free energy, they remain constant while the second or derivative it exhibits an abrupt discontinuity at the phase transition. For example, what is the uh, second order uh, 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 rather second derivative? It is suppose say del 2 g del t 2 at constant p. What is this? This is nothing but equal to del del t of del g del t at constant everything at constant p. So, therefore, this is nothing but equal to minus yeah or in other words this is nothing but equals to del s del t at constant p which is nothing but equal to C p by t. So, and in the same way we can also write del du 2 g del t del p, this is also this can also be found this is equal to beta v. So, therefore, for the second order transitions we find that these two parameters they would be undergoing an abrupt discontinuity while the first derivatives would, would remain constant. And uh, so, so, therefore, uh, whatever transitions we had discussed in the last class all of these they refer to the first order transitions. Now, along with that I would also like to remind you that in thermodynamics we have been dealing with equilibrium states. Now, all these equilibrium states that we deal with all of this refer to stable equilibrium states. You will be recalling from mechanics a very typical diagram where this refers to the stable equilibrium, this refers to the unstable equilibrium, this refers to the metastable equilibrium states. Now, for most of the cases we deal with stable equilibrium states while phase transitions they refer to metastable equilibrium states and some particular equilibrium states for example, you say suppose water is existing below 0 degree centigrade or in other words sub cooled water or maybe water existing above 100 degree centigrade. For example, it is the superheated water or maybe steam existing below 100 degree centigrade which is nothing but the sub cooled vapor. So, these particular states which are extremely unstable. So, these particular states they are known as uh, the, the metastable states in classical thermodynamics. We mostly deal with stable equilibrium states and during phase transitions we are we deal with metastable equilibrium states. Now, you must be uh, I would also like to mention that just like in mechanics we have found out that the potential energy extremum in the state of equilibrium and that implies that when that extremum is maxima the state is unstable, when the extremum is minima then the equilibrium is a stable equilibrium. In thermodynamics also as I have already mentioned in, in one of the my previous classes stability of a thermodynamic system 
in terms of the extremum of some thermodynamic property, it can be either maximization of entropy or minimization of energy. Well, so with this I come to the to, to the topic which we are going to discuss today that we are going to discuss little more about the phase transitions or the phase equilibrium thermodynamics. And here I would like to mention that the task of phase equilibrium thermodynamics is to describe quantitatively the distribution at equilibrium of every component among all phases which are present. For example, suppose we are performing distillation of a mixture of alcohol and water and we would like to know that under a certain temperature and pressure conditions, how much amount of alcohol or water would be distributed between the liquid phase and the vapor phase. Again suppose we would like to extract acetic acid from a solution of toline, acetic acid in toline use, using water as the solvent. We would like to know how much amount of acetic acid would be distributing itself between the two liquid phases or in other words what is the maximum amount of acetic acid that can be extracted from toline using water under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. Now, the thermodynamic solution to, to such phase equilibrium problems was obtained several years ago by a person Gibbs who we will be referring very frequently during the course of this phase equilibrium thermodynamics. He gave a solution to this problem by introducing the abstract concept of chemical potential which we had defined and we had discussed some aspects of it in the last two classes. Now, we just note that although chemical potential it has got a profound influence on phase equilibrium thermodynamics, it is basically an abstract concept. It does not have an immediate equivalent in the physical world and therefore, it is desirable to express chemical potential in terms of some auxiliary function which might be more easily identified with the physical reality. In this class, we would attempt to relate the abstract concept of chemical potential of a substance to a physically measurable quantities like temperature, pressure, composition, etcetera. Now, in attempting to simplify the abstract equation or rather the abstract concept of chemical equilibrium, G. N. Lewis, he first considered the chemical potential of a pure ideal gas. And this I guess I had already derived in one of the one of the previous classes, we found out that chemical potential for ideal gas at constant temperature can be obtained from this particular equation. He, he observed that under isothermal conditions, the change in the abstract thermodynamic quantity that is chemical potential is a simple logarithmic function of a physically real quantity that is the pressure. And so, in this particular way he could relate a mathematical abstraction to a common intensive property of the real world. But we need to remember that this was applicable just for an ideal gas. Let us see what happens when we are dealing with a real gas situation. Say for example, a real gas which is obeying the virial equation of state. What is the virial equation of state? We have already discussed in uh, while we were discussing the PVT behavior of the gases. This we write it down in the in the in the pressure explicit form, where the constants are functions of temperature only. So this can be written in this particular form. From here we can very well define V as R T by by P, which is nothing but equal to dividing throughout by R T P by uh, R T P by P, we get sorry multiplying throughout we get the equation in this particular form plus R T D 3 P as a function of T P plus so on and so forth. Now, suppose we we try to compute D mu for this particular condition. We know that for constant temperature this is equals to V D P. So, therefore, if we compute this from say state 1 to state 2, 
we try to compute this from state 1 to state 2, what do we get? The expression is something like 1 to 2 d l n p plus r t b 2 p t integral 1 to 2 d p plus r t b 3 p as a function of t 1 to 2 p d p plus so on and so forth. On integration, we can write it down as mu 2 minus mu 1 equals to r t l n say p 2 minus p 1 plus r t b 2 p as a function of t into p 2 minus p 1 plus r t to p 2 square minus p 1 square plus so on and so forth. Now, this is applicable for any other equation of state as well. Now, we find that this equation is exact, but this will be different for each and every gas and it turns out to be more convenient particularly for calculations involving chemical equilibrium to maintain the form of the equation which is which is shown in the form of the equation which is represented here. So, therefore, what Lewis he attempted, he wanted to maintain this form of the equation by defining a property or an auxiliary function which is fugacity, where fuga in Latin means flight or escape. So, therefore, what he did the equation which, which was developed for or rather which was obtained for ideal gas he tried to maintain this particular form of the equation for all substances whether it is substance or or a, or a, a component in a mixture for all substances he tried to retain this particular expression simply by replacing p with f the fugacity of the mixture from where we can get just like we had we had got in the no, for the case of an ideal gas, we can get on integration of this equation, we can get this as r t l n f by f 0. Right. It is better we write f i referring to a component i. So, therefore, if we do this, then in the process have what have we done? We have buried the entire non ideality of the gas in the expression for f. In this particular case, what is the expression of f if we assume the gas to obey the virial equation of state? This will be equal to then d l n p plus say b 2 p t d p plus say b 3 p t p d p plus so on and so forth. So, therefore, what do we find? What have we done in this particular case? We have just retained that the ex type of the expression which we have obtained for an ideal gas and in and this particular uh, the, um, equation this is valid for any component in any system whether it is a solid a liquid a gas whether it is a pure whether it is mixed whether it is ideal whether it is non ideal in everywhere we ca we can use this particular function fuga or, or this functional form of fugacity and we would like to remember that this particular equation will reduce to the equation r t d l n p when we are we would be dealing with ideal gases the only thing which we need there are two things which we have which we need to remember in this particular respect. The first thing is we need to remember and in fact I had mentioned this earlier regarding other properties as well. Here also we need to remember that the defining equation of d mu be it for a real gas or for an ideal gas we find that we, uh, we cannot compute the absolute value of mu because the defining equation of mu is in terms of a differential equation which on integration gives a difference difference quantity. So, therefore, the important part here to remember is that 
we, we can define the entire equation, but the standard state that we select that is arbitrary. We can select anything as the standard state, but we need to rem remember that the standard states have to be same for both mu i 0 and f i 0. If suppose for mu i 0 I select the, the lower limit of integration to be uh, at p equals to 1 bar, then f i 0 also has to be computed at 1 bar. This is the first thing which we need to remember, the entire thing arises because the equations which we are dealing with in phase equilibrium thermodynamics, most of these are differential equations or they are difference equations. In fact, let me remind you that phase equilibrium thermodynamics becomes much more complex not due to the concepts of the equations, but more due to the, the need or the importance of the reference states which are known as the standard states. The other thing which I need to mention is that if I have defined a quantity fugacity, then it is very important and I would like to find out this particular quantity fugacity at any particular conditions of temperature and pressure and that has to be provided I can perform this integration with respect to some particular condition where I know the value of fugacity. Is it clear to you? The, what I mean to say is that so, if I want to calculate or rather if I want to find out the utility of this particular equation, then I need to integrate this particular equation and if I am integrating this particular equation, it has to start from some particular reference condition where the value of fugacity is known. Now, where do I know the value of fugacity? I know the value of fugacity at very low pressure under which condition all substances can be assumed to, to be in the gaseous state and the gas at such low pressure behaves as an ideal gas. Because I know when the gas behaves like an ideal gas, then under that condition the equation is d L and P. So, therefore, the point is that this particular definition it is not complete unless I specify the lower limit or I specify the limiting condition of fugacity and this particular limiting condition is suggested in this particular form. When we are dealing with a pure gas or a single component gas, then the condition is limit p tends to 0 f by p equals to 1 and suppose I am dealing with a mixture of gases which behave ideally at low pressures, then under that condition it becomes limit p tends to 0 f by the partial pressure of the gas at 0 at uh, the very low pressures. So, therefore, it is very important for us to remember that once we have defined fugacity, it is important to remember that in order to define fugacity, we need two equations. The first equation as I have already mentioned, it is d mu equals to r t d l n f and along with that we need to mention the a subsidiary equation which states this where for pure gas y i becomes equals to 1 and the condition becomes limit p tends to 0 f by p equals to 1. Unless this is specified, the definition remains incomplete because just a differential equation without an idea of the value at any of the endpoints of the integration is definitely meaningless. Now, here I would like to mention that it might appear to you that we are just going around and around in circles. What are we doing? First, we defined chemical potential, it was an abstract quantity. We did not know what to do with, with it or rather we, we wanted to find out a straightforward way of defining it. We wanted to keep matters simple. So, therefore, we defined fugacity. This is another unknown quantity adding to our problems. So, therefore, immediately it appears that we have we are just going on in circles and we are not doing exactly, we are not achieving anything useful, we are not going in a straight road, road towards understanding more of phase equilibrium thermodynamics. But the reality is in defining fugacity, what we have actually done, 
we are now in a position to use all the thermodynamic functions which have been defined for ideal gases just by replacing pressure with fugacity. So, the only thing that we need now at this moment is to find out or rather to devise a straightforward way to define fugacity. And the other important part is it is very important to remember that this particular equation this is applicable as I have already mentioned this is applicable for solids, liquids, glass, gases, pure mixture everything it is applicable. So, in that case it the, the power of, of uh, the definition of fugacity arises from the fact that we are in a position to define fugacity for any particular component for any particular system for whatever we de define the limiting condition that I have proposed here or the limiting condition that is written down here it holds well and in this particular uh, by, by defining this particular uh, uh, quantity we are in a position to use whatever thermodynamic functions we have developed or devised for an ideal gas. And uh, the, so, therefore, in order to so therefore, there are two other things which I would like to clarify before winding up this particular lecture. The first thing which I would like to mention is that very frequently we would be coming across a term like f by p. This term we come across very frequently in fact, we get this this term more frequently than f because for most of the cases we, uh, we would like to define fugacity with respect to pressure at a low pressure. So, this particular term is usually defined as a fugacity coefficient phi. The other thing which is very important is this particular term f by f 0. We find what does this term signify you tell me this term signifies the activity or this term signifies how active the substance is in its in the in the state of interest compared to its standard state. So, therefore, this particular term f by f 0 this is also defined as activity it gives an indication of how active a substance is relative to its standard state because we would like to remember that f by f 0 or in other words ln f by f 0 or r t ln f by f 0 it gives a difference between the chemical potential of the substance at the state of interest and the standard state. And we would also like to remember another very important fact that this particular derivation was done isothermally and therefore, it is important to remember that when we are dealing with these equations the standard state temperature must be the same as the temp as the temperature of the state of interest while the pressure and composition need not and indeed they are intended not to be the same. We continue with our discussions regarding fugacity, fugacity coefficient activity in the next class as well.